All right, well, everyone, welcome to another edition of the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group here. Uh, my name is Mike McCoy. I'm our chair of the organization. Uh, just want to be able to make everyone be aware. I'm going to share my screen real quick as uh, we want to go over kind of intro stuff and uh, housekeeping items. So within the Hyperledger Healthcare SIG, uh, we want to just have a... Um, to let everyone know that this is an open, free uh, working group. Uh, if there's anything that may be under NDA or anything competitive to you and your startup or your federal entity, please do not disclose it here within the group as this is an open source group and we don't want to be held liable for any trade secrets or any industry knowledge that uh, may not be uh, widely accepted to the world. So uh, just so you know, uh, this that's the rule I have to say before we do these sessions, as well as we uh, want to be able to have an open space where all ideas, comments, and suggestions are made free, especially questions. There are no dumb questions here. Please do not down anyone for having a question that may seem elementary to you. Uh, we are all trying to learn in this space, and this is uh, uh, mainly for educational purposes as well. So uh, thank you for your courtesy, and thank you for your respect in all our presentations. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, one that is uh, John Walker from the COVID Credentials Initiative, the CCI, and which is also a, a partner of the Linux Foundation Public Health Team. Uh, he is a solution architect. Uh, you see his bio here, you probably read it before coming into here, but John has been uh, able to inform me and others of a special kind of digital signature that is uh, technically wrapped in JSON-LD that supports BBS signatures. We went over this about two weeks ago, him and I, uh, as, as a preliminary discussion. And I thought it'd be very helpful for the group to understand what this technology is, how it works, how it operates, and how it can be implied to help true, decentraliz true decentralization and help imply, uh, um, how can I say this? I guess safer guidelines and more interoperable guidelines in order to transact and uh, showcase digital signatures and digital health passes, as there are many different companies looking to build out this architecture, build up these solutions. And we even had a company in Provici about a month ago, that will present their findings on this as well. So uh, I give the floor to John. John, thank you very much for coming uh, so early in the morning for you where you are on Pacific time. And uh, please take it away. Great, thanks Mike, uh, great to be here. And um, as Mike said, I, we have a, I just have a discussion deck to go over um, today. I'd like to introduce the COVID Credentials Initiative. Um, being hosted by the LFPH, and then talk about um, a particular type of uh, zero knowledge proof uh, that can be applied to JSON LD data and the implications that has with uh, in the, the generation of privacy preserving credentials that can be applied in health passes. So let me um, share my screen and I take you through just a few, some discussion slides and please, I'd it's really important to, ha to have an open discussion and um, talk. This is a pretty nascent space. So there's a, a lot of discovery and early work going on. So I hope we can dig into that. So, so folks can let me know when, when they can see my screen. We sure can. It. Great. Okay. So as I said, I'd like, we'll talk about. Um, I'll give some high level context of really the, the uh, detailed topic, which is JSON LD and zero knowledge proofs and the implications um, that that uh, technology has in verifiable credentials. So first, let me say something uh, real quick, just about the, the CCI. Uh, folks uh, aren't familiar with that initiative. Uh, it's really, it's been a community group um, that uh, sprang up uh, in April of 2020, and uh, basically just grass, grassroots international um, technologists, uh, public health uh, experts, and other uh, related domain experts joined. We've had 400 participants. Uh, the goal of the, of the group was to um, really have an open community where we can help deploy privacy preserving verifiable credentials in order to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and basically and strengthen our societies and, and get the economy back on its feet. So um, again, as I mentioned, 400 uh, individuals have participated, over 100 uh, companies. And that work uh, 
went on throughout the summer. Uh, and ultimately we were able to formalize our community a bit more and get support. Um, and we've got basically a, a team of uh, three, three folks that have been, uh, that are working with the Linux Foundation Public Health uh, to strengthen the effort. And basically I'm working with Lucy Yang, who's our community director, myself as the architect, and then Clea Young, who's the ecosystems director. She has a very, very deep background in the identity space. So fortunately for, for CCI, we, we're very pleased to have uh, been brought into the Linux Foundation Public Health back in December and um, LFPH builds, secures, and sustains open source software to help public PHAs combat COVID-19. The, the GAIN initiative was very successful last year. Um, and <clears throat> LFPH has obviously has a, a range of relationships with public health authorities uh, and is a trusted partner in the emerging technology uh, space. And so we, we feel very fortunate and been very lucky to, uh, to be working with them. Um, our work streams and our structures are basically, we have three work streams. We have a use case implementation work stream uh, where we take uh, demos from community members uh, who come in and basically uh, show us how verifiable credentials and digital health passes can be implemented um, and they map back to uh, use case work uh, that was done back in the spring so that's very active we also have a rules and governance uh, work stream that is put together a governance framework we think that um, because of the societal and kind of the techno societal implications of uh, you know, verifiable credentials that it's very important um, that it's uh, the, the this technology is balanced with uh, ethics and uh, a, a cross-disciplinary uh, view, right? And, and review of, of, uh, of what's being proposed and potential implications. And then finally, we, we've uh, formed a, a vaccine credentials focus group. So given the, the recent need and interest in uh, vaccine credentials, uh, we've decided uh, to uh, Create a focus group that's going to work just on that uh, and go basically uh, jurisdictionally based starting in the U.S. to try and, and develop uh, POCs uh, and pilots with, with jurisdictions within the U.S. So that's how we've laid out our, our work. Our goals are really to uh, create and develop open source software and uh, that software will be applied to uh, if you're not familiar, the, um, SSI has basically a, a trust triangle that, that all of the, the software and the actors operate in. And that, that triangle is basically you have, you have an issuer, a holder or a user who has a wallet and a verifier. And so we're really looking to identify um, opportunities or, uh, you know, vendor or, or individual's code where we can come up with basic um, user wallet and verifier apps. And so we're looking for the to confirm the, the minimal requirements for those um, and then make them available. Uh, so basically in the public health context of little or no cost, um, we can roll, roll this technology out and apply it uh, to the pandemic. So drilling down into this uh, trust triangle a little bit, I just want to point out that this is basically the essential uh, entity model for the self-sovereign identity and verifiable credentials. Um, so working from, the, from the, the left, you have an issuer, which is a governing or some responsible entity that is willing to and capable of um, creating a, a schema or a definition of data that will be used for the implementation of a, of a credential, in this case, a vaccination credential. Um, that issuer, uh, with that data definition of the credential, Leverett keeps those definitions in a verifiable data registry, right? So the, the keys, the definition of the, the documents that go in there and 
their schema definitions go into a verifiable registry. Um, the, the most common implementation of this uh, these days is you probably heard of it, DIDs and DID methods, right? So this is where the, the keys and the schemas are uh, defined and kept in DID documents in a verifiable registry. The holder is, an, is the individual um, and that holder has a, a wallet, but more importantly, the wallet is, is where obviously the uh, uh, credential presentations and any public keys being used are stored and also the, the credential, but most important is really the, the holder agent, right? So that, that's really the, the smarts um, that has to be applied to the credentials so that they're used in the correctly for presentations. And then moving finally to the, to the right, basically a holder presents their credentials to a verifier, right? So it's, I wanna get on an airplane, I wanna get into uh, a store. And so the verifier can um, read the presentation digitally, read the presentation that the, the holder has and confirms its uh, veracity uh, against uh, the verifiable data registry without ever actually having to go back and uh, hit an issue or database or hit some kind of a, again, another centralized source for verification. So that, that's really the, the, the primary model for the, the self sovereign identity uh, entities. Any, any questions on that or? Hey, John, I'm sorry, this actually prompts a question and I think it's just me, it's not your graphic. The verifiable data registry, I mean, that could be anything, right? That's essentially pointing to the, whatever ID proofing mechanism or process that's in place Exactly. In in the you know in the in so particularly in the hyperledger context, right? Very popularly, that's going to be um, hyperledger ND, right? And this, this right. agent, the, the software that that's represented in is you know hyperledger Aries. But there's nothing about the, the conceptual or logical model that requires you know those are implementations, right? Successful implementations of how to of how to do this, but it's not a requirement. Great. Okay. So the um, let me see. go back to this slide. So there are basically there are three main flavors of, of these credentials that that are uh, that leverage the W three C standards. And so we want to talk about those real quickly, and we're going to focus on um, the JSON LD, but. but be known that there's the three flavors are JSON LD, JSON Web Signatures or JOTS, and then a um, a VC that basically it has a JSON representation, but it's called a zkpcl. It's got a particular cryptographic signature that's applied to a JSON data structure. And there's you can there's a whole world of information to to drill into. Uh, about these three flavors. I refer you to a, a paper that uh, my colleague, Clea Young, has just written on, on, just, on just that and what the pluses and minuses are. So um, for our discussion today, we'll focus just on the, on the JSON LD with DBS plus signatures. So there's the key functional advantages of the JSON LD ZKP with BBS plus signatures is that the, the zero knowledge proofs um, can leverage uh, JSON LD data structures to create um, what's called linked data signatures. And those signatures uh, allow basically a, uh, uh, allow the, the credential, the whole data structure to be broken up into individual messages. And this is really, this is really key because what this enables is what's called selective disclosure. So by, by having a, uh, a very well articulated JSON LD data structure and then breaking its uh, properties into, into, into an array of messages, uh, we can apply basically proofs to the individual attributes, right? The individual object properties. And this is, this is really, um, it has a lot of really positive implications, particularly in with uh, health related data, where again, you want to be 
you want to have an absolute minimum data set that you uh, present or prove to anyone. And then um, again, ultimately this um, provides the ability to have very specific and discrete digital signatures applied to credential attributes. So I'll give an, an example of a flow of um, how, basically let's say fire-based uh, data uh, regarding an immunization uh, uh, administration or vaccination administration event could be transformed and, and some of the technologies uh, involved. So working from the, <clears throat> the left to the right, basically uh, we, start, we assume that uh, access to the, the data would be a fire-based data source. So that could be an EHR, could be um, an IIS um, in particular jurisdictions. Uh, and the, the, um, the structure of the fire-based data is, in, is what's called a bundle. And so basically, um, we, any processing assumes a valid access to uh, via what's called smart on fire protocol, access protocol to that R4 bundle. And there's a very key um, uh, transition that, that takes place when, when we're doing this in, in the context of verified credentials. In the, in the EHR world, in the, in the clinical world, right, that data is, is, is active, what we call it. Basically, the, those um, EHR records are being updated. Immun immunization and vaccination events are, you know, that is active. Once we pull that data, once we query that, right, we're really in a read-only world. So it's very important that we can demonstrate that there is no change to, to the data uh, and that it represents uh, exactly, you know, the, the transaction or transa transactions um, as they existed in the, in the HR world. So the, the first important thing is that we can demonstrate that there's a valid, uh, let's call it an immunization bundle in, in this example. And that immunization bundle of data might have patient immunization, and let's say practitioner. In this case, the practitioner is the clinical practitioner. So with that valid data set, basically um, we want to get to, to JSON LD data. And so we want to transform that, that bundle uh, in, in R4 is natively in a JSON format into, into a JSON LD. And then identify all the personally identified information, all the attributes that are in that. And with that kind of pre-processing, then we're in a position where we can actually take a, uh, or apply an issue of schema and via ARIES and a you know, did, did method processing, we can apply these cryptographic um, processing and algorithms to the, to the data. What that gives us then is a very privacy preserving presentation of the uh, vaccination credential. And that same data can also be, again, we, we we're outside of the EHR world now. So we can persist that in any kind of a um, semantic uh, container or read only data container. So that's kind of the, the flow of, from the SSI perspective of how, how one would uh, create uh, a, a crypto, you know, a verifiable potential with BBS plus signatures. Any questions on that? So that's I have an initial of question that may sure. help uh, broaden other questions. So before in this group, we kind of lightly reviewed the smart health dot cards Mm -hmm. um vc model and in uh, to, to my understanding they have that connected to an ion did met method that then is connected onto a blockchain so how does something that's smarthealth.cards differ from this model which uses a, a zkp jsnld vbs signature what is the main difference and uh and and how is this help for interop purposes or, or if it does or does not Actually, let me jump in real quick and say that um, um, Josh has stripped out the, the ION public did reference and is focused only on a JWT credential now. Okay, that's good. So the, the couple, great question, a couple, a couple key differences there. One is the, 
in the, the smart card model, you're, it's really the format of the credential, which is, which is the, the JOT. And what the JOT does not, it takes multiple steps of processing. You could kind of create a selective disclosure, but basically you, you end up doing a lot of permutations on the data to, um, to, to create a, um, a, a selective disclosure credential. You can't apply the zero knowledge proofs. You basically need the, the JSON LD data structure or structure of the data to, uh, to apply the, the BBS plus zero knowledge proof. So that's probably the biggest, the biggest uh, key right there. And the, the other difference is that in, in this model, uh, the, the smart card model works inside the, the EHR context, but it, you're really, uh, you're given just an instance of a credential um, that you know, was, was based on some EHR transaction. You're not able to, in, in this model here, with that uh, vaccination record, you could permute and, and you know, have several different uh, privacy preserving credentials right, or presentations of your credential. So you could, you could, with one set of data, you could create the, the presentation to you know, go into a store versus the presentation that you would need to get on an airplane. Right, those could be different attributes, and it's really the JSON L, LD um, data structure and, and the processing on that that allows you to to do that to create those different presentations, um, and all without having to, to go back and permute it again and again against the same data record. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, yeah. I have a question, if I could. This is Doug Bullet with the Fireblocks. Uh, consortia um we're still operating over just raw fabric hyperledger could you discuss or maybe this is just too in the weeds for today's conversation but could you discuss what the essential differences and value-added attributes of indy and aries are in this scheme so indy is is the is a, the the blockchain right the, the ledger for the did documents and all the um, all the keys, all the public keys, so it you could you could write those documents to you could write that to Fabric, you know, the 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 biggest difference is it really with with Aries is as the this agent right that allows this processing allows the communication between the schemas. Uh, from issuers, holders, and verifiers. You need methods, right? You need a definition of the functions you're going to use, which are the, the did methods, and then the, the schemas for what data is going to be processed. So that's probably the, 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 the biggest difference is that the, um, there's a lot of functionality in, in ARIES, and I, you would have to uh, either adopt that and, you know, and write to a, a fabric you know, DLT. And John, if I could add, so Doug, one of the biggest differences is, is that um, several years ago, the same folks who were involved, and John, correct me on any of this, but a lot of the same folks who were involved with the Sovereign Foundation and the principles of self-sovereign identity and identity world also looked at, at, at Hyperledger Fabric as a foundation and then said, you know, what can we do to apply the principles of self-sovereign identity, which means decentralized identity uh, identifiers uh, and, and the ability to disassociate specific individual attributes to the transaction record that you'd see in Fabric into uh, a new flavor of, of blockchain. Uh, and that's where I guess really, John, Indy came along first and then, and then Aries was built on top yes. of that to have those attributes around the agent. And now in the Trust Over IP Foundation, our perspective is that you have multi, you have these different layers of the architectural stack and, and typically Indian Aries reside at layer one to support layer two, which, uh, layer two, which is the decentralized identity foundation uh, DIDCOM protocol. And then associated on top of that is the agent, which are W3C verifiable credential standards. Fabric as designed is really good at what it does, but it's it's a bit like applying a Corolla to a situation that needs a, 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 a Nissan Frontier pickup, 
Um, and um, uh, it was specifically tailored to meet the principles of the Sovereign Foundation's uh, uh, principles of SSI. Thanks, John. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's, correct. that's correct. So, uh, Kamlesh here, uh, I have a question. So, so, uh, so it means like uh, the hyperlayer fabric can't be used for building the SSI and verifiable conditional uh, solutions. Or uh, if someone, like suppose, I know about the verified.me from the IBM, they are using fabric to build that similar kind of SSI and DID solution. Yeah, so IBM Fabric is writing their own DID spec rather than necessarily using an open standard. And, and nothing against them. I mean, um, as John knows, Marie and Eric Bassini from, uh, from IBM are part of uh, um, uh, CCI and they're involved in Good Health Pass, but, but basically engineered their own workflow. Uh, and, and when I say engineered their own workflow, from a Lumetic perspective, we've built this as well. And we've had it reviewed by the compliance folks from a HIPAA compliance perspective at Providence Health. So, so it, it has gone through some measure of review as well as the fact that um, you know, the Indy Aries community has a tremendous number of contributors to the RFCs aligned into various standards. Nothing necessarily wrong with what IBM's approach is on their health pass system, but, but they kind of have this middle layer that they architected themselves and then write to fabric. I can't say authoritatively whether or not what they've engineered aligns in the same way that the RFCs from Indy and Aries were designed to map to SSI or that, that HIPAA compliance has reviewed um, our architecture using Indy Aries and, and, and found it acceptable. Mm, okay, so, so, so uh, okay, they got it. So for example, suppose like what are the W3C, DID and verifiable credential spec if someone, because at the last we need the, some kind of verifiable registry, some kind of uh, decentralized registry of the, the credential. So that, that laser could be the anything, maybe the blockchain, maybe DLT or uh, could be anything. Mm -hmm. It could be anything, but the, the ledgers themselves have properties and attributes that when looked in the context of the overall architecture um, may violate principles of self-sovereignty based on how you're able to associate individual attributes back to transactions on the ledger. And so Indian Aries, and this is where I start to get in the limits of my understanding of the RFCs, to be honest, but, but Indies and Aries architected out uh, or abstracted out those architectural considerations specifically for, for like SSI and for GDPR. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the you don't, the, the one key design principle, right, is that you um, don't want to duplicate or, um, no, you, you don't want to duplicate the, the personally identifiable attributes that are in a credential or the definition, the, the did doc of that credential, you know, on like multiple chains or in multiple places, right? You want to minimize, you want to minimize where where they exist and minimize the access to that. And so that's as Jim talking about the ab abstracting out, particularly in Aries, right, is where a lot of work has been done. And that's just um, again to have the the Aries agent or to work on how an Aries agent would work or write to uh, any blockchain. Right is, uh, is is certainly possible, but the the, the pairing of uh, Aries and Indy was you know, very advantageous in our in architecture. Okay, thank you. So I, I again just to 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 go back. I think the 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 key enabler. Right for the um, uh, ZKP BBS plus uh, proofing is being able to get this uh, health information in, and we think the, the best way to uh, the best information to leverage or the best format to leverage is, is a fire formatted data uh, is to get that into a JSON LD format, and so I have a, from the um, the guys at a company at uh, Matter uh, have done some really good work on this. Uh, they basically they have produced the uh, BBS plus ZKB BBS plus libraries um, and signatures that are used in use. And so this is a 
uh, just as an example, right, of what a W3C credential looks like. And th this is for a vaccination record um, with a BBS plus digital signature. And so it's, uh, you can, you know, see at the, at the top, basically it's, you know, with the, setting the context with JSON LD, <laughs> excuse me, so we can um, identify uh, the properties and the attributes below, and then it, it leverages um, the did key method, just, just in this example. So it basically it, it is using a, a persistent did um, for the functions, the methods and the documents. And then the key is at the bottom is leveraging the BBS um, signature library, right? Which allows us to, to get this type of signature and, and it's the related encryption. So the good news is that, you know, these guys are, you know, it's, it's early on, but they are actually, you know, really, really using these libraries and um, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. So what I want to point out here also is that this is the, um, for the, uh, the vaccination vocabulary, you see, we've got um, all these, for the subject, we have all these properties. And then by uh, using selective disclosure, enabling that with this, this signature proofing, the next slide, we can see that there's a subset, right? When I would go to, this is a presentation that there's just, I can limit, right? The subject can be defined with a subset of those attributes. And yet the proof value below, when a verifier would look at that, the, the proofing demonstrates that this full definition of, uh, of a subject is valid, but I'm only uh, disclosing, if you will, a few, of the, a, sub, a few of the attributes. And that's really, and, and that can be permutable, right, against an overall um, vaccination record. So that there's a lot of uh, power and privacy preserving capability in that. So these are just examples. This stuff is out there today. Um, highly recommend folks uh, check out their, this is the, their kit links and um, really good work. And, and a lot of, lot of, you know, there's a world of educational background uh, that you can grab onto there. And I just touch upon something that someone brought up in the chat. That, uh, John's done an excellent job of presenting the JSON LD verifiable credential and W3C standard. Uh, that credential can exist with or without a decentralized infrastructure below it. And so, and, and John can comment on this, on, on this too. I, I think he and I both know a number of people, including Kalia, that are on the WHO expert review committee. They haven't officially decided anything as yet, but I think that the global trend is around verifiable credentials, which is which is their objective, and the use of JSON LD as that as that format. But there are countries that would consider doing that based on where their their information is um, in a centralized way. Um, so you have an application in a mobile wallet who will present that credential for verification of vaccination, but it's using a centralized system. Um, this approach is specifically built on an, on an Indie Aries uh, uh, framework to offer decentralized. And, and the real reason being is, as we, we consider in Lumetic is because you, you should have the right to enforce privacy principles and, um, and personal protection of data as part of presenting that credential and not be dependent on a centralized governance authority. Right, and it, great point, Jim. Again, the issuer, there's nothing about this, you know, the logical model, right, for implementing verifiable credentials that, you know, says that the verifiable data registry has to be distributed, right, or, or has to be a blockchain. So as long as it, you know, sufficiently meets the requirements for, you know, authorization and security, and you're, you know, you're, you're using it in this model as far as what to, what to store, documents and the uh, public keys then that's yeah I mean, it's it's entirely implementable and viable 
Yeah, and that's where an organization or a or a governance authority may choose to use Hyperledger Fabric as a blockchain control mechanism for the verifiable credentials. What becomes another conversation then is whether or not they want to enable a self-sovereign identity capability of which Fabric would not be the choice for that, but you could still get many of the, the positive values of having a blockchain managed infrastructure for credentials and just use Fabric instead. Yeah, the, the, I mean, again, the good news is that the these entities um, can be implemented right in, in using different technologies. So that's entirely viable. So that was really my, that was my, my presentation. I just wanted to tee that up and, you know, engage in, engage in the discussion. John, if we could go over in particular, um, how potentially a BBS plus signature anchors to the subject name of a subject in particular. So, and, and what that means, so we're all trying to understand, okay, great. We're, we're having computational trust. We're able to then verify to different data points, user domains and, and logic. How does that BBS signature, signature or, or ZKP differ or, or, or add a specific benefit to the overall solution? So the, the um, so zero knowledge proof is, allowing you to um, present a, a fact without presenting some of the, the detail below the fact, right? So you can, um, you can you'd have a presentation of saying, you know, I'm, um, my, I'm older than 18, but you don't have to present the date of birth, right? And so in the verifier, the person who's by, uh, having the the verifier use that um, that schema and accept that that uh, presentation, you're able to not disclose too much information. You can be very discreet about the information you disclose. So that's the the net benefit of, of zero knowledge proofs, and then BBS plus also allows the selective disclosure. So you can have five uh, all my uh, immunization records, I can um, selectively disclose the relevant uh, pieces of that or attributes on that, that I want for a certain um, instance, right, to go to, uh, I don't know, my allergist versus, um, you know, getting on an airplane, right, those are, there are different parts of that record that are relevant uh, for disclosure. So you can have zero knowledge proofs which leverage selective disclosure. So again, you can be very discreet in, in the- And who, the and who could be able to see that, that exactly. data point, exactly. And then, so some people, it's really all about the, the rule engines, right? It's about what rule engine and what right. uh, method you can are able to trust in, in, in this type of technical architecture. In particular, uh, so we've mentioned before the smart health cards and the common pass methodology. Someone may be okay with the rule engine that common pass provides, but for something else like IATA or, or, um, or good health pass, uh, there are different permutations because you have different access rights, whether they're exactly. global international access rights and other things. Uh, could you elaborate on, on technically how this architecture may make that more feasible or may, um, more make that uh, more applicable to the solution? Well, it gives, so if you have different requirements from IATA, um, again, then um, just getting in and out of um, an event in, in, you know, within your, your country or, or crossing a border crossing um, versus an international travel requirement. This, you want to issue the, the credential once and have it be secure but you want you want to recognize that that the individual right is is responsible for creating the presentations so they control right what the the subset of attributes that i i present to iata meeting their requirement versus um the customs guard and it's not you don't have to go back to some central database and re recalculate or re you know recompute um your 
your data requirements. You can create it once and then the, the presentation. So that, that's really the agent um, software against a wallet that could be used against the schema to create these different permutations, right, of the, of the information you want to disclose. And it's, it's under the individual's control. The jurisdiction and the verifiers have agreed this is the minimum set of information. So that schema is out there, you know, the data uh, exists, the data attributes exist. But uh, you, the individual, right, uh, have the ability to, again, have selective disclosure of, of what, you, what you present. One other question I have, and I'd love to open it to others who may have questions as well. How does a JSON-LD bundle differ from a JWT bundle? I know they're not, not exactly the same, but the different right. schemas, how do they compare, contrast in, in overall, in the sure. overall solution? Right, so there's a, um, this, this slide is relevant. So first, the, the the J, JSON LD, right, is you're going to be able to leverage. So I've highlighted here these all the, the different schemas. So think of here we're, we're leveraging a, a, the W3C credential format. And then there's uh, these are uh, exploratory um, vaccination and, and uh, BBS security uh, schemas. But this allows you to um, configure. Right again, what what the entities are that you're going to describe? In this case, the credential subject in a, in a, a jot. Um, it's basically you have uh, you're going to a, a, a IATA, you're going to a, a a registry, right, for the definition of entities versus having the the World Wide Web, right, and all the different consortiums that can that can provide um, schema of uh, of authority, right. So one, you've got a you've got a, an open uh, access to data definitions versus uh, one registry, and then two, again, you can be very selective. Um, your data structure is less baked, if you will. In a, in a jot, it's it's really permuted, um, just you know, just once, and you can't. I mean, it, it's harder to manipulate. Basically, you have to have additional steps. To manipulate the job, it's an absolutely valid, you know, data structure used, you know, in many places. But it's not open to all the um, system or registries of record, if you will, uh, that you get with JSON LD. And that makes a that makes a very good point. So in a way, JSON LD gives you more choices, and and then in another way, JWT, if you have a a network or even a central organization or group that needs to make sure that. You're not having many data schemas. You're just following this one, either centralized or given data schema. Then it'll be a, a it'll be a it won't be universally accepted, or it'll be harder to be universally accepted. But it'll be more secure and it'll be more streamlined in your kind of analysis, evaluation, or uh, authentication method criteria. Is that fair mm -hmm. to say? I think it's fair to say. I mean, to me, the John schema it, it's just more brittle. Kind of people. Each, you know, when you create that um, that structure, it's you're locked into that, right? It's just harder to um, permute all that. Certainly, from a from a credential generation perspective. Would love to hear other opinions on this too. If anyone would like to chime in, uh, if if my understanding is incorrect, or or if uh, if I'm maybe missing a specific detail on this. Uh, you, you're not, and of course, uh, John's overview is excellent. It, it's it is important to consider that about about it's it's easily understandable or excuse me easily interpretable that json ld is is you know quote unquote better than than jots but um to, to john's point like for instance uh um josh made the decision to go with jwt for the smart health cards model because he's approaching the use case and the um uh the the framework governance framework to be deriving the credential from a certain place in a certain way for the user's wallet. And JWT does have what I'd call some advantages in terms of its, if you're, if you know where you're going to, you know, it can be, it can be lighter weight. Um, yes. it, it, and, and, and so it's, um, 
hey, I have a small yard, so I'm only using an electric weed whacker. I can't go across the street to use my weed whacker for my neighbor's yard because my neighbor's yard is twice as big. But for me, an electric battery powered weed whacker is just fine. It has the same properties as the gas powered uh, um, um, lawn hog that my neighbor has, but his is bigger and, uh, and has greater versatility to use in my yard or anyone else's yard. Um, say, same thing with JSON LD. There, you, if you dig into it, um, uh, there's some good discussion about the size of the payloads and, mm -hmm. you know, how do I get the attributes of a JSON LD down to a QR code for easy scanning? And those are important things, but, but in terms of, you know, a global standard or something that would be adopted as a global specification, I think we'd all agree you want something with maximum flexibility, um, in a credential environment. And, and that's what JSON LD has, has kind of settled to become within the W3C community. And, and John, like I said, correct me if anything I said there was, was wrong. No, I, I agree. It was, it was great, Jim. And, and also, I mean, the JSON is is more in terms of the the libraries and just its pervasiveness in in software. You know, it is more pervasive uh, and has a longer history than JSON LD. So there's you know you have uh, you know, technical uh, capabilities and technical availability or technical docs to help out understanding. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I would uh, consider this uh, an extension of our 20, 25 year conversation around XML, where we started, which is the same thing, right? And then we moved to JSON and said, when, why can, when you have a small web browser JavaScript communicating with a web, I mean, a server in the back end, why do you need to talk about extensible schemas? And, you know, they're so fatty that it becomes uh, fairly unusable. And then we switch to JSON, but then also realize the value of structures, especially for something like verifiable credentials. So I think we are just kind of trying to find the medium, uh, kind of going back and forth between these uh, objects based uh, like what Jim said on the use case and JSON LD um, is now emerging as uh, very powerful for what uh, we'd like to do, I think. Yeah, and what John hasn't shared, uh, um, he's here obviously represent himself in his Linux uh, public health CCI capacity, but he's actively involved in TOIP with myself and some other colleagues who are doing great things in terms of extending authorization and consent in, um, in FHIR, uh, again, another JSON representation. And, and John, correct me, but I think some of the things we're looking at for being able to extend consent models, which are in line with the Data Protection Act and things in Europe, are really only, or are most facilitable in, in JSON-LD. They're not something you would attempt to do with JWT. That's correct. And, and if you look at the, you know, the roadmap for, um, for FHIR, HL7, FHIR, the, right now it's R4, their roadmap is going to JSON-LD, and for much more interoperability with JSON LD and basically even a graph model, an RDF model behind, which really unleashes all kinds of very powerful ontology, ontological and analytical work you can do. So we're trying to be forward thinking there and position ourselves um, as, as exactly as, as Jim was saying, it's, it's not just the, just the data payload, it's also the consent and authorization um, that goes with that you want to have a completely aligned with right, any credentialing that you're doing. So we're just trying to uh, be directed to the, to the front of that conversation. And if I could ask uh, also, is there going to be a need then to be able to have fired some fires mobile data, right? And then for those that may not have a mobile service, we're then going to just tie into just HL7 messaging uh, connected by QR codes or someone can scan like an NFC card to be able to represent themselves, right? Are we going to need more translators and compilers to then be represented in BBS credentials or in, in other type of uh, schemas and formats? Like, how are we gonna be able to not only make it not just fire ingestible, but is there ways to be able to write a, uh, uh, an, another HL7 message or a DICOM image to then be represented in a JSON LD translator? Is that possible now? Or is that something we need to be able to build and make? Well, as far as messaging goes, I, at least the, the tack that the, the fire community is taking is there. There is a um, standard based on implementa implementation guide to get from fire message uh, from HL7 messaging to to fire. 
So their suggestion there is to not uh, leverage the the um, basically get get it get it into a JSON format, right? Get it into a Firebase format, and then manipulate it from there. As far as the uh, com compiling, um, I know I know the DBS Plus has uh, libraries in um, Rust, Node, and Python. I think so. There, there probably would be need. I, I can't speak to the the DICOM, um, how how that would work, how that would be manipulated. Uh, putting a because I could see images being associated, whether it's an image of a person just with their facial scan, or or um, I don't you know. There's different biometrics you could be able to use imaging, and if it's a pro, if it's a verified and appropriated by a healthcare. Entity, you may have to have it in specific format, but uh, it, it could be mentioned in Fire too. But it's just pretty much getting it to that JSON method and then being able to extract it and send it out. And there's some real interesting. Um, I suggest everyone, you know, if you uh, come and join uh, the LFPH uh, Slack dialogue, there's some real interesting work going on there with biometrics and again other representations, right, or or cross channel representations of verifiable potentials. There's some uh, great work going on with, uh, you know, simmering down the BBS signature to get it into a QR code and um, talk of, you know, how do we get, how do we get these credentials represented just on a piece of paper? If that QR code could, you know, basically have a, a BBS signature embedded in it. There's some really interesting discussion going on. John, if you could, could you send a link into that in particular right now? If you could take 30 sure. seconds to do so. Yeah, sure. Yeah, if you go to um, covidcredentialinitiative.org, John, is that correct? You can sign up for free and, yeah. um, and you can get access to the Slack channel there too. But Mike, to go back to what you're saying, that was a great discussion. And from a healthcare perspective, what we're looking at is each of the use cases. So, um, you, you know, they're, they're, uh, Imagine, if you will, you're associating the verifiable credential, the the uh, the the JSON LD VC, with a patient identity. Um, that patient identity is then associated within the EHR to the record, and then Fire is the means of transport for um, for the healthcare information. So you may have a JSON LD representation of Fire information, like with the vaccination credential. Or you may just be using it for authorization of brokerage of fire messages between, you know, one or more EHR instances or systems as part of a healthcare transaction. Um, you couldn't you couldn't embed a, J, a DICOM object into a JSON file because it's just too honking big. But what we're what we're exploring next in the Lumetic Exchange in the in the working group is can I associate DIDs with DICOM objects and image files? So that I have a decentralized identifier that then associates back to my identity. I present my verifiable credential for, for authentication and authorization. It's associated with a did to a particular image. And then maybe the, the notes or the clinical details associated with that image are a fire message. So I can share both. That is very interesting. And that is something I would be very, I'm sure all of us would be interested in talking about more. Uh, at some point. Um, yeah, no, that's a, uh, that's great info. Maybe we can talk about that in two weeks. Who knows? Um, but yeah, any other questions before we, we head out everyone, please. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, John. And thank you everyone for the great questions and the back and forth. Thanks, John. My pleasure. Thank you guys. It's a very broad topic. I'm, you know, happy to, uh, if there's, you know, further interest to drill down into different aspects of it and, and come back and, and, you know, share with this group. Because there's nothing better to talk about than healthcare data. That's right. Oh my, it's what wakes me up in the morning. Exactly. Frost uh, my flick. John, I know it's, it's early where you are, but we'd hope to have you in, in future sessions as well to help have a conversation dialogue like this. And, uh, did you add the link? You said it's it's covidcreds.org. Is that how you can join in the link, links for public health discussion group? Or there should it, else? Right. Well, there should be a link there to get to to um, the uh, to the LFPH. Should okay. be a link on the on the site, I believe. All right. Well, I'm going to stop.